I think, despite the fact that I'm based just across the channel, this is actually the first time I've given a talk in Paris. And it's certainly the first time I've given a talk on February the 29th. So what I want to do today is to give you a, a flavor of some recent work about stochastic systems with memory, so going beyond the Markovian approximation. And in particular, how that connects to ideas about fluctuations, some of which you might have heard about already in this, this lecture series on a Monday morning. So let me give you an outline of where we're going. I'll start with a, a fairly short introduction motivating the idea of modeling complex systems by stochastic Markovian dynamics, so without memory. And in particular, I'll talk about things which are familiar to many of you, the ideas of current fluctuations and how we can describe them using the mathematics of large deviations. And then having set up that framework, I'll add some memory. And I'll do that in two sort of pieces, two separate bits which have a connection. In the first part, which is slightly more technical, I'll talk about adding memory by making the rates in my system depend somehow on the current, so a kind of feedback. And I'll describe something we call the temporal additivity principle that allows you, in theory, to obtain the current fluctuations in this case if you know what they're like in the corresponding case without memory. And then I'll explain to you why that's actually almost useless and give you instead a kind of approximate expansion about fixed points that enables you to make some progress. And we'll see how that works by applying it to a famous example from non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And then in the second part, which will be slightly lighter, slightly more applied, I'll talk about some work that was part of an interdisciplinary project that relates to memory in real life, or at least about how people in psychology and economics think memory in real life looks. So I'll describe to you something called the peak end rule, and then motivated by that, we'll look at a very simple discrete choice model with extreme value memory. And along the way, there'll be a, a very tenuous link to elephants and a somewhat less tenuous link to colonoscopies. So watch out for those things. OK, so by way of motivation, let's look here at these various pictures of different complex systems. So here we have cars on a highway. I think this is Los Angeles, many lanes of traffic. The top right, we have ants moving along a cable. And then the bottom right picture is perhaps less obvious, but is also a kind of transport process. It's the transport that goes on inside your cells. So it's obviously blown up and fake color. But the red thing is a microtubule, a kind of filament or a track. And the green blobs are molecular motors, which sort of walk along that track and carry things you need from one side of your cell to the other. And all of these pictures have various things in common. In all of these cases, we might know something about how the individual components behave. So you might know what the rules of the road are, or something about the psychology of an individual driver. You might know about the, the chemistry governing the steps of an individual molecular motor. But typically, what you want to know about is what happens when you put them all together. Do I have a traffic jam? What's the flow of stuff in my cell? So you want to go from this individual picture to this collective picture, which, of course, is the realm of statistical mechanics. Something else all of these pictures have in common is that they're all cases where there's some kind of a preferred direction, some kind of a flow. So the cars are going this way. At least they're trying to. The ants are walking this way. In this case, actually, it's pictures of the same thing at different times. So this is a later time, and this is a later time. So you can see that the blobs are tending to move to the right. So there's some kind of preferred direction. There's some kind of flow. And you might care, well, what's the mean flow? What's the mean current? But also, you might care about things beyond the average. What's the probability that on one particular day, the road is particularly bad or particularly good? What's the probability of some wild fluctuation that messes things up in my cells? And that's a, a kind of 
loose motivation to the idea of currents and current fluctuations. So let's think about modeling those things. So all of these kind of systems can be modeled at a very simple cartoon level within the framework of stochastic Markovian dynamics, or mathematically you might call that interacting particle systems. So you get rid of the details of the individual things, the cars or the ants or the motors, and you replace them just by abstract particles which move according to certain rules. And to be definite, we're going to assume that we have discrete space, so you can think of particles on a lattice or balls in boxes. And at least for the first part of the talk, we're going to assume continuous time, so the particles can move at any time, they're not waiting for a, a bell to ring or a clock to tick. So if I want to describe what my system looks like at any moment in time, well, I need to know about the state space, and then I need to know where the particles are. So I'm going to call the positions of the particles at a given time a configuration, and we'll label that by sigma t. So that's just a snapshot where the particles are at some time t. And then on top of that, I have some dynamics that tells you how those particles move. And we're going to assume that at the level of modeling we're interested in, it's inherently random, so it's stochastic. And for now, we're going to assume that it's memoryless. So what happens in the future where the particles move next depends on where they are now, but it doesn't depend on where they were in the past. So that's the Markovian approximation. And within that <coughs> framework, if I want to specify the dynamics, all I need to do is to give you the set of transition rates, so probabilities per unit time, to go from every configuration sigma to every other configuration sigma prime. And if I have those transition rates, I can build a differential equation, a master equation for the probability distribution. And typically, I'm going to be interested in what happens in the long time if there's a stationary state, so the time-independent solution to this master equation. And in particular, we're going to be interested in systems where the rates don't obey the so-called detail balance condition, so we're in what's called non-equilibrium. And in non-equilibrium, the stationary states are generally characterized by non-zero currents, so flows of particles, just like the flows we saw of the, the cars or the ants or the motors at the beginning. And of course, there, there are various ways you can define a current, but the simplest thing probably to do is just to take two sites on your lattice and to count minus one when a particle hops backwards and plus one when a particle hops forward. So if you do that for some time, then you get an integrated current. So it's like standing by the road, counting the net number of cars that go past you. And often, not always, but often it's relatively straightforward to calculate the mean of such a current. But it's important also and interesting also to understand the fluctuations about the mean, partly because that tells you something about the structure of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, but also for applications, it tells you about the probability of extreme events, which is re relevant if you want to know how robust your infrastructure is, for example. And it turns out that if you look at the distribution of the time average current, so you take this time integrated current, which you measured over some time t, divide it by t to get an average. So if you look at this time average current, it generically, in the long time limit, obeys a so-called large deviation principle, which very, very loosely means that the probability that this time average current takes some value small j in the long time limit looks like the exponential of minus some rate function multiplied by t. So this rate function is going to be zero at the mean current, and it's going to be positive and generally also convex everywhere else. So actually all this does, it tells you that the probability of seeing a current away from the mean gets exponentially smaller and smaller as you measure for longer and longer times. And this rate function quantifies how fast that probability gets smaller. So it quantifies the asymptotic probability of seeing rare fluctuations away from the mean. And of course, the form of the rate function will depend on the model you look at. So as a shorthand for that, I put here this subscript W, 
it will depend on all of the rates in my model to go from one configuration to another configuration. And there's been a whole industry of recent work in calculating this rate function for various different models, both from a, a microscopic, so a lattice-based approach, and also by taking the hydrodynamic limit and looking from a macroscopic approach. So there's been a whole lot of work in calculating this for particular models, and I put some names here of people who've been involved in that, but almost always for Markovian systems, so systems without memory. But we know that in real life, very often, the history of a process is important. There are some kind of long-range correlations in time. So what we want to do now is to, to go from this framework I've just presented and add some memory. To go from the goldfish, which is popularly assumed to have no memory, to the elephant, which is supposed to remember everything. But as soon as I talk about adding memory, you might say, well, how are you going to add memory? There are probably as many different ways to add memory as there are people working on non-Markovian systems. And if you're interested, I can talk afterwards about various other approaches that I've been involved in. But for now, we're going to consider one particular way to add memory, which is we're going to make the rates depend on the current in the past. So this is a class of processes where the rate to go from some initial configuration sigma to some final configuration sigma primed depends now not just on those configurations, but on the time average of some chosen current up to that point. So it's a kind of feedback where your rates are modified depending on the current that has flown in the past. And this kind of process includes analogues of a discrete time model, which really is called the elephant random walk, which is the random walker which remembers its entire history. But also it's a, a relatively straightforward place to start thinking about systems with memory, because although if you just look at the, the dynamics of the particles, it looks non-Markovian, if you look in the joint state space of the current and the configuration, you're back to a Markovian model, albeit a rather complicated one. So just to make that concrete, let's think of the, the simplest possible example we can come up with. So let's forget the many particle stuff, and let's just take a single particle, and let's just put it in one dimension, because it's easy to draw. And... Even easier than that, we're going to assume that this particle can only move to the right on this one-dimensional lattice. So it's a kind of unidirectional random walker. So in the Markovian case, without memory, I have a particle which sits on some lattice site and hops to the next lattice site with some rate v. In other words, it waits there for some exponentially distributed waiting time with mean 1 over v, and then it moves to the next site, and so on. So I now modify this picture in the way that I just explained, and I make this rate depend on the time average current. And really, the only sensible current to measure here is the velocity of the particle, so the number of steps it's made divided by the time. So now I have a model where there's some kind of feedback, and I could make this functional dependence so that the particle moves faster, if it had moved faster in the past, or slower, if it had moved faster in the past, or something more complicated. Notice that this is, this is now not just the same as a space-dependent random walk, because even when the particle sits still, the time average current is changing because the time is increasing. So what you end up with is a particle which jumps to the next site with some non-exponentially distributed waiting time which is a characteristic of non-Markovian processes, that the waiting times for things are no longer exponential. So that's how this kind of memory would work for the simplest possible model you can think of. But you can add this kind of current-dependent memory to the rates in any kind of interacting particle system you're interested in. And then you can ask the question, well, how does this memory affect the current large deviation principle? Do we still have something of this form? And if so, can we calculate this rate function? And the answer is sort of. So the claim is the following. 
if the Markovian rate function is known, and that's already quite a big if, then in theory, one can calculate the large deviation principle if one exists for a system with current dependent rates in this particular way. And the large deviation principle you get might now have a power of t which is not 1 here. So it might have t to some different power, t to some gamma. It might have a different speed in the large deviation principle. And the rate function is obtained by an integral which involves the corresponding rate function for the process without memory, minimized over all paths in current space. And if I can do that, and I can divide it by t to some power and get a limit which is not everywhere zero and not everywhere infinity, then I have a large deviation principle of this form. So this looks pretty, pretty ugly, but essentially it comes from an argument where you say, well, in the long time limit, the time average current changes very slowly, so I can look at periods of time where the time average current is almost constant, and I can look at the Markovian rate function for those time slices with an argument which is the current which flows in those time slices. So it's a kind of adiabatic, quasi-static argument. And then I put the time slices together, and I take the limit where both the length of the slices goes to infinity, but also the number of slices goes to infinity. So it's a slightly complicated limit. And I get this integral form. So the general idea is essentially just that you're looking for the most probable path in current space, so the most probable way in which the, the current can depend on the time over the history of your process, which will give you the desired final current that you want to measure. And it's a kind of temporal analog of a, an additivity principle that was proposed uh, for calculating density large deviation functions in space. So in principle, the argument is, well, if I know this thing, then I can do some horrible integral, I can minimize it, and I can find a large deviation principle for the system with memory. And you can do that for simple cases, like the random walker I just showed you, like some slightly more complicated random walkers, by the standard procedure of Euler-Lagrange and minimization. And what you find if you do that is that indeed you get powers of t that are different from 1 here, and the gamma that appears here depends in some fashion on the strength of the memory. So as you make the memory stronger, you change the power that appears here. But in practice, there are very few cases that you can do that exactly, either because you don't know the Markovian rate function to start with, or because you do know it, but when you plug it in here and you write down the Euler-Lagrange equations, the things you get are so horrible that you have no hope of doing the minimization analytically. So in that case, either you try and do the minimization numerically, and I'll come back to that later on, or, which is what I want to tell you about now, you can do a kind of approximate expansion by looking at what happens around fixed points of the dynamics. So here's the fixed point argument, which we hope is at least going to give us information about what happens close to the mean current. So the argument goes like this. Supposing I know that in the memoryless case, so in the Markovian case, I have some mean current, which is some function of all the rates in the model. So I just use this as shorthand for the full set of rates. Then I claim that under certain conditions, in the current dependent case, I'm going to have a fixed point at just that value of the current, such that this function of the rates with that value of the current gives me the same current. In other words, at just that value of the current, such that what I predict to happen next, the mean current I expect to see next, is the same as the current I had in the past. And as usual, then, with fixed points, you can ask, well, is that a stable fixed point, or is it unstable? So I plot here the, the left-hand side as this blue diagonal line, and some function of the, for the right-hand side as this red line. And we see two possible different cases. 
So in this case, well, I have a fixed point here where the two sides are equal. And then I look at what happens if I see a fluctuation above the fixed point. Well, if I happen to see a fluctuation above the fixed point here, then what I expect to see next is given by this red line, so the function of the rates at that current, which is something smaller. So that's going to drive me back towards the fixed point. On the other hand, if I happen to see a fluctuation below the fixed point, then what I expect to see next is something bigger than what I've had in the past, and that will again drive me back towards the fixed point. So in this case, I have a stable fixed point, and in this case, I have an unstable fixed point by a similar argument. So the stability is very simply determined by the slope of this function f at the fixed point. And I'm going to call that thing capital A star. So if that's less than 1, that's this case, I have a stable fixed point. And if that's bigger than 1, that's this case, I have an unstable fixed point. And if I take this case with a stable fixed point, and I assume I have just one stable fixed point, then I can do an expansion about that fixed point, and I can plug that into the rate function and into the Euler-Lagrange equations, and I can solve them and find out what I expect the fluctuations to look like in the case with memory. And what you find if you do that, I won't show you the details, but you find there's another transition, even for A star less than 1, that if the slope is less than a half, the fluctuations are diffusive, which means that the power you see in the large deviation principle is still t. It looks like an ordinary large deviation principle. So if this slope is fairly flat. On the other hand, if the slope is bigger than a half, but still smaller than 1, you find super diffusive fluctuations, and you get a different power of t in the large deviation principle. So rather than showing you the technical details of where that comes from, let me explain how that works with a particular example. So this is a very famous example, which will be known to many of you, the so-called totally asymmetric exclusion process. So it does what it says on the tin. I take a one-dimensional lattice, and on each side of the lattice, I can either have one particle, that's the black circle, or no particle, the whole, that's the white circle. I can never have more than one particle on the same site. That's the exclusion part of the name. And the particles only move in one direction. So here they only move to the right. That's the totally asymmetric part of the name. With some rate p, but they can only move if they've got space to move into. So this guy can move, but this one can't. And then you have to ask, well, what happens at the boundaries? And there are various things you can do there. But we're going to be interested in the case with open boundaries. So where I put particles in with some rate alpha, if there's a space. And if I have a particle at the end, I take it out with rate beta. So this is a very simple memoryless model. And it's a simple model that has been used as a sort of cartoon model of various kinds of traffic. In particular, with various modifications, it's been used to model all of the things I showed you on the first slide, cars, ants, molecular motors. It's also interesting from a theoretical point of view because it has phase transitions as a function of what you do at the boundaries. So we'll set this rate now to be 1 and look at the phase diagram as a function of the input rate alpha and the output rate beta. And you see these various different phases. But actually, they're, they're quite easy to understand intuitively. So for example, if I'm here, that means alpha is small and beta is big. So that means I'm putting particles in relatively slowly, but I'm sucking them out very fast at this end. So there aren't going to be many particles left in my system. So I'm going to be in a low density phase. On the other hand, if alpha is big, and beta is small, then I'm putting particles in fast, and I'm taking them out slowly. So they're going to start kind of getting congested inside the system. So I'll be in a high density phase, or in the, the traffic analogy, a jammed phase. On the other hand, if alpha and beta are both big, then what controls the current is not what you do at the boundaries, but it's what you do in the middle. And then you're in a so-called maximal current phase. <coughs> 
So this is the picture for the standard Markovian exclusion process. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a very simple modification of this that makes it current dependent, and we're going to try and use this argument about fixed points to see firstly what happens to the phase diagram and secondly what happens to the fluctuations. So here's the modification. We're going to modify in a very simple way. We're just going to make the input rate depend on the time average current. So in the traffic picture, that would be like having some traffic lights on the slip road onto your highway that control the number of cars that go onto the highway, depending on how many cars have gone past in the past. And we're going to take a concrete choice for that to make it as simple as possible. So we're going to make this a linear function, so some constant part, and then uh, some positive constant times the past current. So this is a kind of positive feedback where the higher the current in the past, the bigger the input rate in the future. And actually, this, this form of input rate was proposed independently by these guys um, to model the recycling of ribosomes in protein synthesis. Although a slight difference there was that they, the current they look at is a kind of instantaneous current. Whereas here, we remember, we have feedback on the time average current over the whole history. And that affects the fluctuations. OK, so we're going to take this form of the input rate. And then you can, knowing the form of the mean current for the Markovian case, you can look for fixed points in this current dependent case. And you can obtain a modified phase diagram. So here's the modified phase diagram for one particular value of A. So it's now a function of this constant, alpha 0, against the output rate, beta. And what you find, which is perhaps not terribly surprising, is that the positive feedback on the input rate increases the size of this maximal current phase. But then also it changes this phase transition line between the low density phase and the high density phase from a straight line into a curved line, which you can calculate. And in fact, if you take larger values of A, so stronger feedback, then this curved line intersects the axis. And then you can check this, this argument uh, with simulations. So on the right, I show you simulation data for precisely this model for the average current after one very long trajectory. So again, I have alpha 0 and beta. The black lines are the red lines here. And the colors are smooth numerical data. And you can see it seems to fit very well. So let's look at that slightly more closely, uh, because three-dimensional graphs are a bit hard to, to check carefully. So the argument is that the fixed point in this picture determines the mean current in the different phases. And when you go through the steps of that argument, you find that the, the fixed point, so the mean current, doesn't change in the maximal current phase or in the high density phase, but it changes in the low density phase, which is the phase which is controlled by the input. And it has this analytical form. So this is the prediction for the mean current in this low density phase. And then you can check that a little bit more carefully with simulations. So what I do, do here is I show you a cross section across the line beta equals 0.6, so somewhere about here. The blue dashed line is the predicted mean current, so it's 0.25, it's a quarter, just like in the Markovian case in the maximal current regime. And then in the low density regime, it takes this form, which is this line here, and the points from simulations agree very nicely. But I told you that I wasn't just interested in means, I was also in, interested in fluctuations. And remember that I could get information about them by looking not just at the fixed point, but at the slope of some function at the fixed point. And if you go through the steps there for this particular model, you find that you get super diffusive fluctuations, so corresponding to the slope being greater than a half, but less than one, for values of alpha 0 less than some critical value. And you can explicitly work out what that critical value is. On the other hand, 
if alpha 0 is above the critical value, so if the constant part of the input rate is relatively quite large, then you get just diffusive fluctuations, but now with some modified diffusion coefficient. So the picture in terms of the phase diagram is that there's a, a slice, I hope you can see it down here on the left, a slice in the low density regime where the fluctuations become super diffusive, so they become particularly wild, at least around the mean current. And then in the rest of the low density phase, the fluctuations look diffusive, but with some modified diffusion coefficient. And again, you can check that with simulation. So I look at the same cross section here. And if you look first at the red points, what I plot is the variance of the time integrated current divided by time. So in the diffusive case, that would just give me the diffusion coefficient, which I predict to be this blue dashed line. And the red points are the simulation data, which agree with that. And the diffusion coefficient diverges at the predicted value of alpha c, the predicted critical value of this alpha zero. And then in the green points, what I do instead is I plot the variance of the time integrated current divided by this modified power of t that depends somehow on this magic a star, this slope. And that's the thing that's predicted to be finite in the super diffusive case. Uh, so again, the blue dashed line is the prediction and the green points are the simulation results and it agrees pretty well. Okay, so actually for this particular model, you can do a little bit more because in fact, the current large deviations for the Markovian case are known in all phases of the model. And this is it's very impressive work by, by a range of people over the last few years. So you can take that Markovian rate function. You have to do a little bit of work to put it in explicit form, but you can take that, you can plug that right back into this integral, and you can minimize numerically. And you can then compare that with the results from our heuristic approximate fixed point expansion, which is supposed to recover the behavior at least around the mean. And that's what I show you in this picture. So this is again the same linear form for input rate, and I take a value of alpha 0 0.2. So first look at the black points. They're the case without memory. So in that case, the mean current is alpha 0 times 1 minus alpha 0, so it's 0.16. So the mean current is this, this 0 here. And the dashed line, the black dashed line, is the exact known analytical uh, rate function for this memoryless case. And the black points are the results of doing this numerical minimization, which agree as they must do with this exact form. So that's just a kind of sanity check for the memoryless case. Then I add some memory by taking a non-zero value of A. And what that does is, first of all, it shifts the position of the mean current to the right. So this is just a blow up around the minimum. So it makes the mean current larger because we have a kind of positive feedback, but also it makes the width wider. It makes the fluctuations uh, more likely. And what I plot in the red dashed line here is again the result of this numerical minimization. So using the known results from the Markovian case and plugging them into this integral. And the red points are the points from my approximate fixed point argument. And you can see that it works very well close to the mean, but not so well in the tails. And actually, that's what you would expect, uh, because this is essentially a quadratic approximation about the fixed point, so it always gives you a Gaussian form, a quadratic form for the large deviation rate function. So it works around the mean, but it doesn't work in the tails, and that's what we would expect. OK, so just before I finish this, this first part, let me make some, some comments about the, the general effects of current dependent rates that we've seen in this model and in other work that I've not shown you. So one thing you see is that 
long-range correlations in time in non-equilibrium systems have somehow similar effects to long-range correlations in space in equilibrium. So that you can see, for example, a modified speed, so in this case a modified power of t, in the large deviation principle. You also have the possibility, which I've not shown you, but you can show that you have the possibility of having a, a non-convex rate function. And that's analogous to the fact that in equilibrium, in systems with long-range correlations in space, you can have a non-concave entropy. And one model where you might expect to see that here would be to take the, the zero range process, which has a phase transition, a uh, dynamical phase transition with bounded rates. You might also ask about what happens to fluctuation relations. I know many of you have been at the lectures before and hearing these lectures about fluctuation relations. Do I still have these kind of fluctuation relations in systems with this kind of memory? So within the, the approximate expansion about the fixed point I showed you, you can answer that question very easily. So I can look at the probability of seeing some negative value of the current compared to the probability of seeing the same magnitude in the positive direction. And you find that for A star less than a half, so in the case where the memory is weak somehow, I get something which looks like an ordinary fluctuation relation, so the exponential of something times linear in J and linear in T, with some modified coefficient here, which depends on the exact value of A star. On the other hand, if A star is bigger than a half, but still less than one, so this case of a stable fixed point with super diffusive fluctuations, then I see something which is still linear in J, but now has T to some different power. And this is kind of reminiscent of a modified symmetry uh, seen in a different kind of anomalous dynamics. But actually one has to be very careful here because this argument only holds around the fixed point, and you can show that if you have a large deviation function which is quadratic, then what you get here will always be something that's linear in J. So it really has nothing at all to say about whether or not this holds in the tails of the distribution. And in fact, you can find models with this kind of current dependence where you do see the fluctuation relation um, also in the tails of the distribution, so for arbitrary large and small values of J, and you can find models where you don't see it. And it seems to be connected to this condition of direction time independence, which is related to whether or not the bias is in some sense constant. But there are still open questions here. Okay, so that was the first part of the talk. Let me, in the last 20, 25 minutes, talk about other forms of memory that are possibly more realistic. So we know that as humans, we don't just take a straight average of everything that happened in our past. We don't just remember the most recent things, but that particular events, particular snapshots, tend to be important in our memory. And I'm going to tell you about one way that can be encoded in a moment. But let me first of all take an aside to tell you about the project that's part of. So that's part of an interdisciplinary project that I was involved in called the Reflect Project. That's its short name, its long name, a feasibility study in experience, utility, and travel behavior. Uh, this was a collaboration between colleagues at various universities in the UK and from various different academic disciplines. And it was funded as part of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, so our main funding bodies, Transport Grand Challenge, Travel Behaviour, Habits and Practice, Sandpit. And if you've not come across the idea of a sandpit, it's something that was popular in the UK at least a few years ago. And the best way I can describe it as, is as kind of an academic version of Big Brother. So the idea is that you get academics from all sorts of different disciplines together, you shut them in a hotel for a week, you make them do all sorts of slightly strange activities, games, brainstorming, with the hope that eventually they then form into little groups and start to develop possible solutions, possible proposals to tackle some grand challenge that might ultimately get funded. So that's where the money came from. Actually, after I'd been to this, I discovered what EPSRC say on their own website about such things. 
that they try and select some people who do not quite fit the norm, and that the intense pressurized medium of the sandpit has a way of exposing the hidden, darker side of human nature. So if you want to know whether that was true, ask me afterwards. But um, in any event, that's where the money came from. And what I want to do now is to try to explain to you what utility is, so this economics concept of utility, what experience utility is, and what all of this has to do with the ideas of memory that we saw in the first part of the talk. So the idea of utility goes back very loosely to a guy called Jeremy Bentham, who was around in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and can still, in fact, be visited today. Here he is. So he sits in a box at University College London, so just down the road from where I am. Uh, this is really his body, preserved in some way, I'm not sure. It's really his clothes. It's not really his head, because they had trouble with students stealing his head, allegedly students from King's. Uh, so his real head is in a safe somewhere, and this is a wax version of his head. But in any event, he sits in this box, uh, they open the doors in the morning, it's sort of in the cloisters of University College London, uh, and they close the doors in the evening. There you are, <laughs> eccentric Brits. Um, so he, he was involved in the foundation of University College London and left his body to them to be preserved like this. But he also postulated this kind of obvious greatest happiness principle which is this idea that human beings are supposed to make decisions in a way that maximizes their happiness. And that's sort of the forerunner to what modern economists would call utility, the idea that we're all rational agents who make decisions to maximize our benefit somehow, encoded in this idea of utility. And as far as I understand, there are several different flavors of utility, uh, but let me just tell you about two of them. So there's the idea of experience utility, which is what economists interpret as the well-being, the benefit, if you like, loosely speaking, the happiness you get when you're actually doing something. So when you actually make a decision, the benefit you get from it. On the other hand, there's what's called decision utility, which is this basis of this whole theory that we're rational agents, we look at the utility for different options, and we choose the one that will give us the most. So it's the level of utility that people think they're going to get, the level of benefit before they make a choice. So if I'm deciding whether to take the bike home or the car, the idea is that I think which will give me the most benefit, and I pick the one with the biggest utility. And it's clear that these two things might not necessarily coincide, partly because we mispredict the future, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but also because we misremember what happened in the past. So we forget the traffic jam last time we took the car, or we remember only the cycling uphill and not the nice bit of cycling down the hill. So this idea that we remember some things more than others leads to this idea of the peak end rule, which is part of the, the subdiscipline of behavioral economics, which is an attempt to sort of insert psychology into economics and it's been popularized recently by Daniel Kahneman, who got the Nobel Prize, and various others. So the, the original experiments, which are, are supposed to motivate this peak end rule, come not, in fact, from experiments on happiness or on benefit, but experiments on pain, which for our purposes is just the same as utility, but with an opposite sign. And in particular, there were experiments on pain during colonoscopies, so horrible medical procedures where they stick a probe in your backside and, and move it around. And what these guys did was they took a bunch of patients who, I'm told, had to have colonoscopies anyway. And in most countries, not in all countries, you don't have a general anesthetic for that, but you have some kind of mild sedative, so you're still awake and you can feel the probe being moved. And so they asked these patients, while this was going on, every minute to rate how painful, how uncomfortable it was on a scale of 0 to 10. And they constructed these graphs of pain against time. And then at the end, when the whole thing was over, they went back to the patients and they said, can you give a rating for your, your whole experience? 
in order to calibrate that, they ask for it to be compared with other known unpleasant things like stubbing your toe or having your tooth out. And what they found was that a very good predictor for how people rated this whole experience was simply to take the peak part, so how unpleasant the worst bit was, and the end part, so what the level of pain was in the last minute or two. And some kind of average of this was a very good predictor for how they evaluated the whole experience, which leads to this so-called peak-end rule. In particular, the length of the experience didn't seem to be too important. So that's what people call duration neglect. So if you look at these two graphs, then naively we'd say, well, OK, this is the graph of pain against time. So the area under the graph is the integrated pain. So this person clearly had a much worse time than this person. But in fact, this person reported a much better experience than this one, seemingly because they had a much gentler time at the end. And supposedly, they actually checked this, this proactively by keeping the probe inside people longer than was, was needed medically, but making the last bit particularly gentle, and everybody went home happier. So I think the paper is called something like Where More Pain is Preferred to Less, and it's published in the journal with the title Pain. So maybe that's something to aspire to. So the idea of this, this Reflect project that I was involved in was to use a, a smartphone app uh, to sample people's experience while it was actually going on, not, thankfully, in the context of colonoscopies, but in the context of transport choices, and then to feed that information back to them and see how it affected their future decisions. So to try and get round this distorted bias by giving people, if you like, the whole graph rather than just the extremes to base their future decisions on. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about a side project that came out of that, which is to analyze this kind of peak-end memory in a very simple toy model. So here's my toy model. I have an agent who, at every time step, so we're now in discrete time, can make one of two choices. Let's call them plus or minus. And we simply keep track up to some time t of the number of times he makes the plus choice, call that capital X plus, and the number of times he makes the minus choice, I call that capital X minus. And in fact, they have to add up to t because he has to make some choice at every time step. And if you think about this for about 30 seconds, you see that this is actually exactly the same as having a, a one-dimensional random walker who hops to the right or left with some probabilities that I haven't yet told you, where you keep track of the number of steps he moves right and the number of steps he moves left. Actually, it turns out to be slightly more elegant to consider instead the fraction of steps right and the fraction of steps left, or if you like, the velocities right and the velocities left. So far, so boring. That's just an ordinary random walk. The new ingredient here is that at each time step, I'm going to associate an independent, identically distributed random variable that I'll call capital U, because it's supposed to remind us of this utility, this benefit, this experience, from some distribution with a known cumulative distribution function. And it's the same distribution for the steps right and for the steps left. So a priori, the system is symmetrical. Just each time I make a choice, I draw some value of this experience random variable. And the crucial point is that the agent separately remembers the maximum value of the u's for all the times he ever stepped right, and I'll call that capital U plus, and the maximum value of, of the u's for all the times he ever stepped left, so I'll call that u minus. And that's just a formal way of writing this. And then I feed that memory, so that memory of the maximum experience, of the peak experience, into the future probabilities for going right or left, and I'm going to take this particular form, which is known in the economics literature as a logit decision model, but is kind of reminiscent of Boltzmann factors in physics. So here's the picture again. Random walker who goes right or left with probabilities P plus and P minus. Where the capital T that comes in here is sort of the level of noise in the decision. Or if you like in a physics analogy, it's the temperature. So if capital T is very big, 
then actually it doesn't really matter much what u plus and u minus are. These things are both going to be approximately equal to a half, and you'll have something that looks like an ordinary random walker stepping right or left with equal probabilities. On the other hand, if t is small, there's a bias in the direction of whichever is bigger, u plus or u minus. So this is a kind of positive feedback that says I'm more likely to go in the direction where I had a better experience or where I remember a better experience in the past. And then the question you might ask is, well, what happens in the long time limit? And if you look at the form of these equations, you can see that there are, there are two obvious fixed points, and you can show that a bit more carefully. One possibility is that asymptotically u plus and u minus are equal. So these probabilities are both asymptotically equal to a half. Random walker steps right or left with probabilities a half at each time step. So the net velocity right and the net velocity left are both a half. And in terms of the decision model, I have a kind of mixed decision state where the agent samples both choices. On the other hand, you could imagine that somehow it turns out that, let's say, u minus is negligible compared to u plus in the long time limit, and then p plus will be asymptotically 1 and p minus will be asymptotically 0, and I'll have a velocity 1 in the rightward direction, 0 in the left direction, or vice versa. So you can imagine an uh, asymmetric fixed point, which, in terms of the decision model, is a sort of frozen decision state, where although everything was symmetrical, somehow, on the basis of your early experience, you've got locked in one choice, and you just keep making that choice. And the question we want to ask is, well, can we drive the agent into this mixed state by increasing the value of the noise? And apparently, this is what economists want to believe, that if you add more kind of disruption, more churn into people's lives, they switch between their decisions more. And the answer, which is sort of obvious is that it depends on the distribution of the U, on the distribution of these experiences. And you can see that within the following very simple approximation. So let me now replace U plus and U minus, which are fluctuating random variables, by the so-called characteristic largest value after the given number of steps right and left. And this is just the quantity from extreme value theory that tells you typically how the largest um, value from a particular sample scales. Okay, so it gives you this, the typical scaling, the characteristic scaling of the largest value if you take a set of x plus trials or x minus trials. And formally, it's defined as the value of u such that the CDF is 1 minus one over the number of trials. So it's very easy to calculate. But keep in mind just that it gives you the characteristic scaling of what you expect the largest value to scale like. And if I plug that into my p plus and p minus, well, they now become deterministic functions of the number of steps right and left, or equivalently of the velocity right and left, or if you like, the net velocity and the time. So now we have a model that looks very much like the kind of models I was looking at in the first half of the talk, where the random walker steps right and left with probabilities that depend on the velocity and the time. And in fact, this is just a, a rather ugly generalization of the original elephant random walker, or going back much, much further in the maths literature, it's a nonlinear polya urn problem. And then you can play exactly the same games we played in the first half of the talk, and you can look for fixed points, and you can look to see whether they're stable, and then you can try and find out, well, do I get stuck in this frozen state where I only make one choice, or am I in the mixed state? And if you do that, actually it turns out that you can use the power of extreme value theory, which tells you that there are only certain universal behaviors for the scaling of the maximum, and within this approximation, you then find that there are only three possibilities. The first possibility is that your distribution of experience has heavy tails, so for example, a Pareto distribution. And then this argument predicts that the agent eventually becomes frozen in one choice, regardless of the level of noise. 
And actually, that's quite easy to understand intuitively here. If I have heavy tails, then at some point, I'm going to pick something way out in the tail of the experience, let's say for a rightward step. And then I'm overwhelmingly more likely to go right. And then I'm even more likely to pick something even further in the tail for a right step, and even more likely to go right, and I can never escape from that. On the other hand, if my distribution of U is bounded, so it has some, some finite maximum, then eventually the agent samples both choices approximately equally in the long time limit, again, regardless of the level of noise. And again, that makes sense intuitively. If I have some maximum value of the experience, then eventually, if I wait long enough, I'll have seen that maximum for steps left and for steps right, and then the problem will look completely symmetric, and I'll go left or right with equal probability. So I'll make both choices approximately equally. On the other hand, the interesting case is the case where my distribution has exponential tails, and then indeed I do predict a transition from a frozen state to this mixed state as I increase the noise, possibly with some logarithmic dependence. And to try and convince you that this works, I show you again here simulation data. So this is a histogram of the time average velocity after 100 time steps in the case where the utility has an exponential distribution and where I predict a phase transition at the value of noise equal to 1. So if you look at the red points, their noise is 0.8, so below this phase transition. And indeed, the histogram is very sharply peaked at a net velocity of minus 1, so always going left, or a net velocity of plus 1, so always going right. On the other hand, if I take a value of noise above the transition, then I see a peak around the symmetric fixed point, so this mixed decision state where you sample both. And then you can ask a bit more detailed questions. Well, what happens to the width of this peak as I look for longer and longer times? So if this fixed point argument is exact, I would expect these things to get narrower and narrower. And if you do that in the exponential case, where you predict this phase transition for value of noise equal to 1, what you find is that a good thing to plot is the standard deviation of the velocity against the noise. So below the phase transition, you expect that to approach 1, because you're stuck in minus 1 or plus 1. Above the phase transition, you expect that to approach 0, because you're stuck in this mixed state. And if you do that, and you plot for increasing times what happens from your simulations, you find that, indeed, there is a kind of transition around t equals 1. And for noise below that, you approach a standard deviation of 1, as you expect. But for high values of the noise, the standard deviation approaches some finite value, even as you go to longer and longer times. And to understand the width of that peak, so the peak has some finite width in the long time limit, you need to consider not just the characteristic largest value, but the full distribution of largest values, which you can do because you know that distribution has a Gumbel distribution. And very easily, you can then calculate a loose upper bound, which is this black line, and with some slightly uncontrolled approximations, you can calculate this dotted line, which is a fairly good um, prediction of the variance you see. If you were paying attention, you might say, well, you told us about this peak end model, but the model you've shown us only had a dependence on the peak. <coughs> Actually, it turns out that in this particular model, it doesn't make very much difference if you add some dependence also on, on the end, so on the last value of the utility. And that's because the final values of the utility are typically much smaller than the maximum and much less strongly correlated. So basically, they, they look like added noise in the peak version of the model. So this is a, a plot, same picture I just showed you, of the standard deviation of velocity against the noise. The red points are a model with dependence also on the end, and the green points are a model with dependence only on the peak, but with double the value of noise. And you can see that in terms of this quantity, the two things look very similar, although there will be other correlation functions that look different. But I think I'm out of time, so, so let me just finish. <coughs> 
Uh, in the first part of the talk, I gave you a sort of general approach to understand current fluctuations in systems with memory-dependent rates. I talked about this temporal additivity principle and about a kind of approximate expansion about the fixed points that enables you to use this. And in particular, we saw that when you have this kind of memory, you can get a modified speed and modified power of t in the current large deviation principle. And then in the second part, I talked about this, this slightly more real life thing. Uh, I explained to you this peak end rule. And we were able to use there <coughs> a fixed point argument, so similar to this one, but combined with known results from extreme value theory. And then able to predict the way in which the long time behavior depends on the scale or the distribution of experiences in the past. And there are lots more things one could do in the future, so both from the physics side, looking more closely at phase transitions, at fluctuation relations, at metastability, at asymmetric problems, uh, more many particle models, but also from the point of view of the uh, decision model, looking, for example, at the case of collective memory, more than one agent who are influenced by the opinions of other people and how that relates to questions of utility maximization, etc. Uh, but I think I'll, I'll stop there. In principle, you'll now only remember the worst bit of the talk and the end, but of course I'm happy to have questions on any of it.